So this was a headline in the Daily Telegraph in 2008. Um, and the front page of the paper probably has the two most important men in the world at that point in time on it. But also, vitamin pills can increase your risk of an early death. Now, this headline comes from a Cochrane systematic review looking at whether or not people should take vitamin pills um, uh, as antioxidants for, to try and make them live longer. And this headline in the Daily Telegraph caused a big outcry. All the celebrities thought the research was rubbish, um, and there was lots of criticism of the review. And Ben Goldacre, who is, uh, writes a science called a, sorry, a column called Bad Science in The Guardian, which is great fun and worth looking at, um, wrote an article on this at the time. Um, and he was trying to explain to readers what a systematic review is and why this review had been well done. Now, the criticism from the celebrities was that they'd picked up um, 2,000 trials and then they'd only ended up looking at 67 of them. So... They biased, they biased what they were looking at. They got rid of stuff. And why they only chose those 67? And, of course, Ben Goldacre then in his column says, well, this is all to do with the Cochrane methodology. You set out to look at something, and you have very strict inclusion-exclusion exclu criteria. And then you end up with the studies that fulfill all the criteria, and you look at those studies. Um, and, actually, it's to reduce bias that we do that. Okay. So I just thought I'd give you a start by just looking at why, how a review can be so important and hit the headlines. And often, if you look actually at the papers, um, the headlines, certainly in some of the broadsheets, the articles on health are very often, um, there's an underlying Cochrane review that's been published to produce that article. One of the big ones that appears is the um, whether or not women should be screened for breast cancer. Um, and a guy called Peter Ghosh, who updates that review regularly, and he actually is in Copenhagen, he's a Cochrane person, um, and every time he publishes his results, it hits our papers because it's quite controversial. It's basically saying that screening isn't effective and that there's over-treatment because of it and we shouldn't be doing it. So it's quite an interesting um, review to have a look at. Okay, so... The, um, the review on um, vitamin pills was this review, Cochrane Review, Antioxidant Supplements for the Prevention of Mortality in Healthy Participants and Patients. Um, and the conclusions of the review are similar to the headline in the Telegraph newspaper. Okay, if you put in the, word, the, the two words, systematic review, in Google, actually I did this a while ago, this is what you find. You found thousands millions of um, results, the top one being the Wikipedia one, but also you're getting the Cochrane Library coming up, and I'll talk to you a little bit about the Cochrane Library towards the end of my talk, um, and why the link is there. But if you look there, it's all to do with systematic reviews and Cochrane, basically, that uh, is being picked up. Okay, so going back in time... Um, and this is certainly going back to when I did my PhD. It was very difficult to do a good review of the literature because where, where did you start? Um, basically, and it's even got worse now because you've got information overload. There are millions of articles published each year. There are 20,000, probably more now, biomedical journals. Um, I'm in the field of dentistry. That's where I um, do my research. And there are 500-plus now dental journals. But also, you've got stuff that's never been published. You've got studies that haven't been published and aren't out there. And then the other problem you've got is that not everything's published in English. Um, some um, important areas, and I think breast cancer is one of them, I think there's some very good studies that are actually published in Japanese. Um, so actually, if you only looked at English language papers, you'd actually get a very biased view of what the, um, the current you know, review findings are for breast cancer treatment. So where, where can you find the best evidence? Well, you can have a look at textbooks, um, but the problem is they're often written by experts, and very often, certainly in medicine, um, the traditional consultant 
had their own view about what worked and why it worked, um, and were quite rigid about that. The other thing is that they're quickly out of date. So you can ask somebody, you can ask somebody, um, I'm trying to think of something that you might be interested in dentistry, seeing as it's my field. You might want to know, is it worth having my teeth whitened? Have any, have any of you had your teeth whitened? Probably, probably wouldn't admit it. Probably wouldn't admit it. <laughs> um, so if you wanted to have a look at the evidence, where would you go to find out what to use, whether it worked, whether to have it done professionally, whether to buy something over the counter from Boots? Um, so you can ask somebody. You can look in a filing cabinet. You might have put a paper away, if it's certainly your field of research. At some stage, you can have a look. You can consult a textbook. Um, you can begin to look at electronic databases. Um, there are lots of them, um, and you have to know how to do a good search to actually get everything. Uh, Medline, Embase, Lilacs. Lilacs is very similar to Medline, but it's the, um, the one for South America. Um, secondary publications uh, is a good idea. Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews. So those are sy systematic reviews that have already been... Somebody's already gone through all this trouble and put everything together for you so you can actually pick it up and you just have to read that review. Um, so if you're thinking about using electronic databases, if we're searching, for example, for randomised controlled trials, this is a bit out of date now, but it still applies, only about 50% will be actually indexed as randomised controlled trials. So you'd be missing trials if you use Medline with the RCT filter on it. Most missed citations, there actually are on at Medline, but it's finding them. You know, it's how, how do you get them? They are there, but how do you get them if they're not properly indexed? Um, you can obviously use the title abstracts and keywords. I mean, structured abstracts have helped a little bit to some extent to be able to identify what things are about. Um, really, hand searching would be the only reliable way to identify all relevant articles. So you'd have to hand search all the dental journals if you were interested in tooth whitening, which would be a huge job, as you can imagine. They're very boring, tedious, time-consuming. And also, we must try and avoid duplication of effort. Um, and that's, this is one of the things that the Cochrane Collaboration have organised for randomised control trials. Um, what they have organised is a hand-searching programme where people have gone back for each journal and they've taken on that journal and they have identified all the randomised control trials, regardless of what the topic was. And then that information has been fed into Cochrane. We have our, our database of randomised control trials called Central, which is better than Medline. And then Central talks to Medline and re-indexes what's in Medline. So Central is the best database for randomised control trials. So if you wanted medical randomised control trials, then Central will be the, the place to search. It's the best place to search. So Cochrane did this to avoid this duplication of effort. So if that journal's been searched, all the trials from that journal will be in, in Central. So you're starting out with a good database. Um, and that was the whole idea. I'm going back in time. It's, it was actually Cochrane's 20th year um, anniversary a couple of weeks ago in Quebec. They had a big um, colloquium, which um, I went to. So the solution, the solution to, I've already um, told you this, but the solution to where to find evidence, where to start, how am I going to answer that question, is to actually have a look at a systematic review of the evidence. Um, and today I'm going to tell you what a systematic review is, what's entailed in doing a systematic review, and then we might talk about how to read them and how to use them. Um, so I suppose some of you may be doers, and some of you may be users of systematic reviews, um, and both um, roles are important to you as students. Um, I don't know how many of you are thinking of doing a systematic review as part of your review of literature. Have any of you thought of doing that? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually think, certainly in the faculty, um, the timing of medicine and human sciences, I actually think most people should be doing um, 
a, a systematic review of the literature for their literature review, or they should be reviewing the systematic reviews of li the literature that there are in their field um, in that section. I don't think you should be doing a traditional review of literature these days, but that's just, you need to think about that one and discuss it with your supervisor. Um, so what are systematic reviews? A systematic review is the process of systematically locating, appraising, and synthesizing evidence from scientific studies in order to obtain a reliable overview. Okay. Now, there's some terminology problems. Um, because the Americans use the term meta-analysis to mean a systematic review. But in Europe, um, and the Cochrane definition, which is an international one, um, a systematic review may or may not contain a meta-analysis. A systematic review is the whole process. It's collecting the papers and synthesising it and putting it all together in a review. Whereas the meta-analysis is actually the statistical bit that pulls the data. So it's like the statistical analysis is the meta-analysis. I'm a statistician by background, so that's sort of my um, strength, I suppose, is the meta-analysis part. Now, it's possible to do a systematic review with no trials, or it could be a, quali a qualitative systematic review where there wouldn't be a meta-analysis. And it's possible if somebody gives you, right, this company, Colgate, have just carried out these 10 dental trials on triacrosan toothpaste last year, can you do a meta-analysis? And that would not be a systematic review, that would just be a meta-analysis of those trials, totally out of context. You wouldn't know what that meant, really, because you wouldn't know where the trials had come from and how they fitted in with other trials. Um, so that's why I've, there's a Venn diagram there. So traditional reviews, which is the sort of stuff that we used to cope with when we were doing our reviews of literature um, many years ago, um, they tended to be, well, it was difficult to avoid them being um, individual opinions based on haphazardly selected data rather than comprehensive systematic assessment. They were inconsistent, prone to error, and unconvincing. Systematic review is prepared very, very carefully, um, as you would a piece of primary research, meticulously. Um, and we certainly, the reviews that I do, we sit down and we write a protocol, a very, very detailed protocol before we start, saying what we're going to do to try and avoid any bias getting into the process. Um, and actually... The Cochrane process is then to get that protocol peer-reviewed. Actually, we then publish that on the library. So if there are any changes from the protocol when you do the review, you have to put them up front, and it's obvious those changes have happened. You know, if you change the inclusion criteria slightly, um, then that will become apparent. A very simple example would be that you might say in your protocol for a systematic review on flossing that... You're only including trials where everybody had to be over 18 years of age. And there might be one trial that actually the inclusion criteria were from 16 years of age, but there were only two people between 16 and 18. And it would seem foolish, looking back, to actually exclude that trial. So you might just amend the inclusion criteria slightly to include that trial, especially if it was a big trial that you felt, well, and then there's bass going in it. <laughs> Okay, so why are systematic reviews important? They reduce large quantities of information into manageable proportions. They formulate policy and develop guidelines. The first place that NICE, um, who developed clinical guidelines in the UK, and SIGN, who developed clinical guidelines in Scotland, the first place they look for evidence of whether an intervention, and the intervention can be a drug, it can be a surgical procedure, clinical treatment, the first place they will look to see whether that is effective or not and whether it should be paid for by the NHS is by looking at the Cochrane Library, at the reviews in the Cochrane Library. Um, and then there's a bit of negotiation if the review needs updating with us or if um, they need a review in that area, then there will be discussion perhaps with Cochrane groups about who's going to be doing that review. And as you can see, um, they're an efficient use of resources because you do the review once and then you update it. Um, and then in, in a way, if you were saying um, 
does triclosan toothpaste, which is an antibacterial toothpaste, reduce bleeding? So as an adult, um, I've got to decide whether or not I want to use um, an antibacterial toothpaste, and the main one is triclosan. Um, a well-conducted review that's being updated would be a great place to start looking at whether or not you should use that toothpaste. If you do a systematic review and you're actually pooling the data from several trials, you get increased power and precision. So rather than looking at each trial, you're putting the data all together if you can. Sometimes you can't, but if you can, and then you'll get an estimate with increased power and precision of how effective that intervention is. And in theory, if they're done properly, they will limit bias or you will know what the biases are and they should improve the accuracy um, of the estimate. I'm going to run through an example, um, which most a good example um, of a systematic review and the power of it. Um, this systematic review was carried out and published in 1992 by Antman. It looked at the treatment of acute myocardial infarction and looked at recommendations in textbooks and reviews and the results of meta-analysis if they had been done. <coughs> so what we've got here is we've got people who've just had a heart attack and the intervention is whether or not you give them a clot-busting drug straight away, whether or not you do that. And the trials, the outcome is whether or not they died. Okay. So I'll just go through it. It's a lot horrible to you, and I could have done with the pointer, but I haven't got one. Um, okay, so what we've got here is each one of these horizontal lines is a trial. So the first trial was carried out in about 1960. Now, don't worry if you don't know what an odds ratio is. Um, it's a measure of the effectiveness of the treatment. And the line... These lower down, you can see the whole line. It's symmetrical um, about the odds ratio. But the line there is, is the confidence interval of the results. So we're saying that we're 95% sure that the true result is somewhere along this line in very loose terms. Now, if that confidence interval crosses this line here of 1, that's the line of no effect. So that means there's no difference between giving these drugs and not giving these drugs. So the first study really wasn't that clear. You, did, you didn't really know whether or not these drugs were working. Um, this is called a cumulative uh, meta-analysis. So by about 1962, there were two trials, and we've added them together. And that confidence interval is getting a little bit narrower, um, but it's still, it's still over the no-effect line. But once we get down to about 1973, we've got a very clear meta-analysis there showing that this clot-busting drug really does work. And I think it reduces deaths by, um, I can't remember now, 30%, say, 30% reduction in death. Um, and then what happened then was there were lots and lots and lots of trials, all showing the same thing. Had a, metro, had a, a cumulative meta-analysis been done at any point, we'd have been able to very clearly say, this drug works and everybody should be having this drug. Because the sad thing is, if you look how many patients here are randomised, 48,154, half of those patients weren't being given this clot-busting drug and you know, had a very high probability of dying, um, when actually they could have all been on it. So for about 2,500, so it would be about 43,000, half that. So it would be about 12,000 patients um, were stopped from having the drug. Um, so I think this sort of gives you an idea of how important it is to do systematic reviews rather than just leave all the trials out there and not trying to put the results together. <coughs> okay, so this is when this, um, whether or not this, clot buster therapy was recommended in textbooks or reviews, in ordinary reviews, not, not systematic reviews. Okay, so to begin with, obviously, they weren't mentioned. They were coming into being mentioned, but very experimental um, by the 80s. Now, when you see that by, it was about 1972, 73, we've got a very clear result here. Um, but it, it's taken quite a long time for the textbooks and recommendations um, to start to recommend it. 
as you can see. We're still not there yet. So it was just being mentioned as a routine treatment um, in the mid-80s. Mid um, yeah, so it's coming through in the mid-80s um, as a routine treatment. But you can see the delay. Um, so had people been doing systematic reviews much earlier on, it would have benefited a lot of people and stopped a lot of deaths as well. So I think it's quite a powerful example. So, as I said, there were discrepancies between meta-analyses and recommendations by reviewers. The review articles failed to mention important new advances and delayed recommended, recommending effective preventive measures, and harmful treatments continued to be recommended by experts. That's the problem. Um, and it's very difficult to think if you... I'm, I'm not a clinician, but if you are a clinician and a patient asks you something and you don't know the answer... Do you try and say something, or do you say, I don't know? Ian Chalmers, who started the Cochrane Collaboration off in Oxford 20 years ago, he, he's an obstetrician, and he said, I don't know how many babies I've killed by telling their mums to put them on their tummies. So, because he said something, he actually might have done harm when, the, when there wasn't the evidence to make a decision. Okay, systematic review process, it's very boring, very tedious, takes a long time, and you need, you need a team of people doing it. Not something to be entered upon lightly, but worth the effort. I really enjoy doing systematic reviews. Um, you need a very well-formulated question, comprehensive data search, unbiased selection and abstraction process, assess the papers, and then you synthesize the results, the data. Um, and you actually saw the beginnings of a forest plot um, a minute ago. Well-formulated question. Um, this is just a question that um, is one of the reviews that I've published. How effective is flossing in addition to toothbrushing as compared with toothbrushing alone in the management of bleeding gums and tooth decay? It's the sort of question that you might want, to, um, you might want answered because you might decide you're going to floss your teeth. So we have a well-formulated question. We have to think about participants, interventions, comparison, and outcomes. So the participants. Um, so if we're doing a systematic review on this, we want it to reflect the sort of people who will be um, using floss. All ages? I don't think so. I think I'd probably want to restrict it to adults, actually if it was me. Um, would you want to look at trials where the people had restricted <laughs> dexterity? Don't know. What about orthodontic patients who've got braces in? Would you want to include those or would you want to exclude those from your... These are all the things you have to think about at the protocol stage before you start searching, before you know what there is. Um, when you're thinking about the intervention, which is flossing, are you just going to give people floss and let them go away and use it? Are you going to watch them use it and do it under very controlled conditions? So what sort of trials? Could they use it as well as a mouth rinse? Would that be allowed? Um, so what sort of trials would you include in the systematic review? If we decide that we're going to compare toothbrushing with flossing, with toothbrushing without flossing, would it be all right to rinse the mouth out with a mouthwash? So you have to think about what you're comparing it to and what else the patient's allowed to do. Are they allowed to use these incidental brushes? Um, and then we have to think about, well, we've got this the, the sorts of trials we want to include. What sort of outcomes are we interested in finding or looking at um, as part of our evidence base? Number of bleeding sites. We might be interested in side effects. Side effects might be, I don't know, you get the floss stuck and break a tooth. Um, the cost, how much does it cost? How much is it going to cost you to do this? So you have to think about other things that are going to be measured at the end of the trial. Um, you, often the clinical things. The number of bleeding sites will probably be the primary outcome because that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to perhaps reduce bleeding gums with, with using floss. I do skip about a bit, but in my head it makes sense. <laughs> okay. Um, you can... 
I'm talking about randomized controlled trials here because um, those are primarily the sorts of reviews that I do. But you can do reviews <coughs> on other levels of evidence. You can do them on cohort studies, um, case control studies, cross-sectional studies, and case series. I'm expecting you all to have vague ideas what those mean. Cohort is a, tends to be prospective. It can be retrospective. But you're just following a group of people along in time. You're not intervening. Case control is a retrospective study where you look at the outcome and then you try and get information retrospectively about um, things that might have caused that outcome. Um, I'm going to give you an example of why you have to be very careful if you go away from doing a systematic review on randomised control trials. This example is looking at a meta-analysis of the association between beta-carotene, um, and that's, that can be given in, a, in the form of um, a pill, or it can be just eating more carrots, um, and cardiovascular mortality, um, so dying of heart disease. Okay. These are the results. Now, this is a different sort of... It's a shame that's not in there. These are a different sort of um, meta-analysis, of uh, forest plot. The one I showed you before was a cumulative one. This one isn't. This one, each of these lines is a study. It's one study. Um, so what we have is, for the cohort studies, um, and you look there, male health workers, male social insurance workers, female social insurance workers, male chemical workers, hyperlipidemic men and nursing home residents. And for that group, we're meta-analyzing the results and we have this diamond at the bottom and that's the pooled estimate. And because it's away from the line of no effect one, we've got a very clear um, result showing that beta-carotene reduces death. So if you take beta-carotene supplements, you will reduce the number of deaths. And it's a very clear result. However, and that was published first. However, when somebody came along and did the same thing for actual trials where they'd randomised people to having the beta-carotene or a placebo tablet, so nobody knew which group they were in, there was a trial in male smokers, patients with skin cancer, former smokers, asbestos workers, male physicians, then we got the opposite result. We actually found that giving people beta-carotene was actually harmful and there was an increase in the number of deaths. So this is just showing you, if you take cohort studies, you get one result, and if you take randomised controlled trials, where you are getting rid of a lot of the bias because you're randomising and you're using a placebo, um, you get a totally different result. The reason being that people who, in cohort studies, the people who have high levels of beta-carotene are the people who are really healthy. They're the fit people. They're the people that jog. They're the people that eat a good diet. So really, those trials, are the cohort studies are biased. Um, and the real answer is the trials. So you have to think carefully if you are including other levels of evidence than randomised controlled trials. So that just summarises what I've said, that they show a considerable benefit whereas the randomised controlled trials show an increased risk of death. OK, the search strategy. So we're thinking about the question. We're going back now to... Um, we've had a look at possible study designs. We're now thinking about the search strategy. Um, you need to consider all these things. So it's not as simple as just going along and doing um, the electronic databases. And you also have to think which electronic databases. There are lots out there. And some are very specific for certain medical areas. Reference lists at the end of trials are really good. There'll be other trials referenced. The hand searching that I've mentioned, um, it's great if you can include non-English language um, papers as well. Um, within the Cochrane collaboration, because we're international and quite big, we can get anything translated within the collaboration. So we are able to include... Um, non-English language papers. And you can, there are ways of finding out of any ongoing or unpublished studies. One way, obviously, is to, depending on the area, but you might write to the pharmaceutical companies um, 
And that's something I did recently for a review on fluoride varnish. I wrote to all the fluoride varnish companies asking about unpublished studies. Um, because there is obviously bias there, if not all the studies have been published. Um, and there are now trials registers, so you can actually have a look on the trials register to see whether any ongoing or any that have been finished recently that might be, they might be writing it up. So you might be able to put the results of those in. So reporting biases. Um, statistically significant positive results. So I don't know how much research you've done, but what you find is if you do some research and you get a nice positive result and you know the journal's going to be interested, you'll, t you'll tend to write it up quickly and the journal will want it, so it goes to publication quickly. If you actually don't find a difference or the thing doesn't work, I think it's probably, often it's the author's fault, not necessarily the journal's fault, but they tend not to publish it as quickly. There's more delay and the journal might be put it as lower priority. Um, so there's publication bias. There's time leg bias, which would also come into that. Um, they're more likely to be published in English as um, at language bias. And positive results are more likely to be cited by others. So you've got a citation bias. So there are all these biases um, in the process. A good example is of a third-generation antidepressant called riboxetine. The original review um, was on 13 trials, and it showed that this was a very good antidepressant. Um, there was another reanalysis in 2010, and they managed to find 74. They managed to find a lot more of the patient data from the pharmaceutical companies about side effects, and the findings of the review is overall an ineffective and potentially harmful antidepressant, um, which contradicted the um, original reviews. And that happens a lot because pharmaceutical companies will tend to not disclose everything. There's a move now that they will do so, and lots of pharmaceutical companies are agreeing to do that. But in the past, they've only published things they want to publish, and they've held back adverse events in the patients or not necessarily reported them um, in a very clear way. Um, we now have trial registration, which I mentioned, um, clinicaltrials.gov, the Declaration of Helsinki, says that every clinical trial must be registered in a publicly accessible database before recruitment of the first subject. And in America, if you, if you recruit patients before the trial has been registered, you are fined, and it's something like $100,000 a day. And it doesn't matter where that trial's conducted. You know, if you're conducting it in India, it would still apply. So... The Americans are really trying to sort that out. Um, and then there's an international committee of medical journal editors which are um, trying to enforce um, some of these things. For example, some journals will not publish a randomised control trial unless they've got the registration number um, and obviously access to things like the um, consent and all, all these other things. Everything has to be in place for them to publish the trial. And all the numbers are quoted on the publication. This is a PRISM flow diagram. This is just showing you um, the process of a systematic review. Um, you identify your records, remove duplicates, you screen them, and all the time you're getting smaller and smaller numbers. And that goes back to that initial slide where they started out with 2,000 and ended up with 67, because they're not fitting the inclusion-exclusion criteria. Um. <coughs> In Cochrane, we always do um, everything, at least in duplicate. So there are two people doing um, every stage of the review, so that because everybody makes mistakes. If you extract data, I think about 5% of the time, you're going to write down the wrong number or make a mistake. So it's important it's done by more than one person. 
We also look at the quality of all trials, um, and the Cochrane Collaboration has decided that we're better looking at components of quality rather than composite scales. Initially, people were saying they're having 20 criteria and ticking them and saying this trial's 18 out of 20, whereas this one's only 16 out of 20. This trial must be better quality. But now we look at each individual component. We use something called risk of bias assessment. Um, and you're thinking about the extent to which results of studies can be believed. Um, this is just an example of how that might work for a trial. Um, these are the biases we normally put in, and then we do um, we try and get stuff from the paper. So we would um, we would actually put the text in from the paper and in this column, and then make a decision um, about whether or not there is bias there. complicated, but this is how the risk of bias appears in a Cochrane review. For each of these um, domains, random allocation, allocation, concealment, etc., we do the judgment, as I said, so it's either um, high risk of bias, which is red, unclear, which is the question mark in yellow, or low risk of bias, which is the green. And then you can look across each trial and see whether on the whole it was low risk of bias or unclear or high risk of bias. Um, that's our process. <coughs> this is a forest plot. We've already talked a little bit about forest plots. Just to give you insight into what you're trying to achieve, you're trying to achieve a pooling of the data, that little diamond at the bottom. This is looking at flossing and bleeding. Um, so this was actually the results of the review. So that's, that's really what a systematic review is all about. It's trying to come to this pooled estimate of the effect, the bottom line, really. So then people can go off and use this in guidelines. And the results of the flossing review have been fed into many guidelines. Cock and Collaboration logo, which is a uh, forest plot, and I'm not, not going to explain it. I normally would do. Have a look at the Cock and Collaboration. Um, it's good fun doing reviews, but they're hard work. Um, I'm... There are... 53 review groups across the world, and each has a different disease area. Um, there's Wounds Group, which is in Manchester. Now, Nikki Cullum's come in to do that. And I'm um, Oral Health Group, Cochrane Oral Health Group, um, which is in the UK. The Cochrane Collaboration is an enterprise that rivals the human genome project in its potential implications for modern men medicine. Sorry. So it's just like the human genome. So we've put all this effort into doing all these reviews, um, and that's what the Lancet think about it. I'm trying to... Sorry, I've rushed through at the end. I was running out of time, but I think some of the earlier examples were worth spending a bit of time on. Um, the Cochrane Handbook's great. Um, systematic Review Book. It's a bit out of date now, but I learned a lot about systematic reviews by looking at that book. And Prisma, which is the reporting of systematic reviews and how that must be done. Um, and you can find all those reporting things on the Equator website. I don't know whether any of you have looked at that ever. It's got all the re for reporting a trial, reporting a systematic review, whatever it is. It's got all this, the standards all put together on the Equator website. Thank you. Sorry it's a bit rushed.